So our last snippet for this week looks at the presidency of William Howard Taft, who had been Roosevelt's Secretary of War, what is now the Secretary of Defense, who serves one term as president, uh, 1909 till, uh, till 1913. Um, Taft is the only president in American history who sees the presidency as a stepping stone to higher office. Uh, in his case, he, he wants to be on the Supreme Court. He, he gets there in 1921 to 1930s, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, he, he is a very there, there's there's an emphasis a lot on law and international law under uh, under Taft. Um, Roosevelt had been interested in international law as well. Secretary of State Elihu Root is is big on the idea of expanding the presence of international law. Um, but Taft often interprets international law as a kind of as, as sort of a way of expanding U.S business economic interests uh, uh, abroad, uh, exploiting uh, weaker uh, uh, countries. Um, and although you kind of think of international law as a, uh, ideally as a way to improve stability, um, the Taft uh, presidency, especially in Central America, winds up being a very destabilizing uh, diplomatic uh, approach. Um, Taft is not particularly helped by his secretary of state, this guy Philander Knox, um, who is, uh, it's not the hardest working Secretary of State that we've we've ever had. I mean, he frequently uh, ends you know ends his day at one or one thirty because wants to go golfing in the afternoon. Um, much like Taft, he's a kind of reflexive, not a particularly nimble figure in, in in diplomatic affairs. He has a particular vision of international affairs and especially international law and the obligations that weaker states assume, particularly like economic obligations that they assume uh, under international uh, law. Um, and both Taft. And, and Knox are, are ironically more willing than Roosevelt was to project American power, military power, uh, to advance U.S. Uh, um, interests, whether strategic or, or, or economic. And the early and best sign of this um, comes in, uh, in Nicaragua. Um, Nicaragua had been it's a country that that had had considerable political instability really throughout its history. If you remember from the the snippets, the first batch of snippets for this week, I mentioned that guy William Walker, the American filibuster in the uh, 1850s, who briefly uh, you know, has a small uh, force and, and and takes over Nicaragua and becomes becomes its president. Um, there is the, the there's a central government in in Managua, um, but this this Mosquito Coast, um, so the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua is a long ways from the capital. Um, the Nicaraguan government had difficulty projecting real control over it. It had been a British protectorate for much of the 19th century. There is there's an Indian community that lives on the coast that doesn't really uh, accept uh, Nicaraguan sovereignty either. Um, and frequently throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, rivals to the uh, to the central government um, use uh, you know, sort of the Mosquito Coast as a platform from which to uh, to to attack. So this is a government that's it's constantly constantly um, rising and, and it's a very unstable country. The Nicaraguan government in the 19th century had taken out substantial loans to American commercial interests. There was an American railroad built by the Vanderbilts that go, uh, goes across Nicaragua. There had been a sense that Nicaragua was going to be chosen as the site for a transismian canal. So it, would, it was a longer canal than Panama, but in some ways an easier one to construct. So you'd build a canal across this portion of Nicaragua connected to Lake Nicaragua um, and Lake Managua and then uh, filter it into the Pacific Ocean. When Nicaragua loses this, it sort of its, its political situation become, an economic situation becomes more unstable. So in any case, in 1909, uh, uh, 1910, there's another uh, revolution in, um, uh, in Nicaragua and a group of American businessmen on the Mosquito Coast who are worried that maybe the new government may not accept uh, the, you know, the, the deals they had done with the previous government, to, uh, to Taft and Knox for, uh, for military assistance. And the result is that the US in 1909 sends American Marines without congressional authorization, sends American Marines to the Mosquito Coast. This is the beginning of, um, uh, of an occupation which will basically last, so there'll, there'll be a, a couple of years where the US troops aren't there, but will basically last until 1933. It's one of these forgotten episodes in, in 20th century US history. Um, and the, the 
the technical purpose of the Marines or the ostensible purpose of the Marines is to protect American interests on the Mosquito Coast. But the actual purpose of the Marines is to install a, uh, a, a, a government that will be favorable to US political interests. And the Marines tend to favor, the, there, there's a liberal party and a conservative party in um, uh, Nicaragua. The Marines favor the conservative party. There was very little ideological difference between the liberal and the conservative party. So it's not as if like one is a left wing and one's a right wing party. They're both pretty elite parties, but nonetheless, the U.S. is is sort of participating in Nicaraguan politics, and then the Marine presence, which which remains throughout the Taft uh, presidency, is is there to sort of prop up this pro-American government in uh, uh, in the region. Unlike uh, Theodore Roosevelt with Panama, where the U.S. had this clear strategic interest in um, um, on Nicaragua, in, excuse me, in Panama, the U.S. strategic inter in interest in Nicaragua is really quite vague one. It's almost as if once the U.S. gets in, then the interest is, well, we're going to stay stable, and so we need to keep the Marines in. It's kind of a circular uh, uh, goal, um, and it's a good illustration of the, the often haphazard nature of Taft uh, uh, foreign policy. A bigger problem emerges in Mexico. This is the longtime dictator of Mexico, Porfirio Diaz, um, who is uh, uh, interested in expanding uh, a Mexican oil presence. Mexico becomes a, a not insignificant oil player in the late 19th century. Um, Diaz is, is no liberal, to put it mildly, um, but he is worried about American presence. He does not want to see Mexico become a, basically a U.S. protectorate like Cuba was, or Panama. Um, and so in the first decade of the 20th century, he starts to encourage European countries to invest in Mexican oil fields. Taft does not like this at all. Um, and so Taft starts playing around in, in Mexican politics. Um, the U.S. gives uh, uh, support to, to a rival of Diaz, this man Francisco Madero, um, who runs for uh, president of Mexico is defeated in a basically a rigged election by Diaz um, and then launches a, a revolution um, and drives, uh, 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 drives uh, Diaz out. Um, the problem is that Madero, although the U.S. had supported his rebellion against Diaz, Madero has no more interest in being a protectorate of the U.S. than, uh, uh, than, uh, than Diaz uh, uh, had um, and continues to encourage European investment in, uh, in the region. The U.S. ambassador to Mexico uh, during this period is, is, is this man, Henry Lane Wilson, uh, no, um, no relation to the future uh, President Wilson. Um, Henry Lane Wilson is a, a caricature of American imperialist. He, you know, he doesn't like that Madero is not sort of playing ball with the United States. He reaches out to anti-Madero forces within the Mexican military, quietly sends a message that, you know, maybe the U.S. would, would look favorably upon a, um, uh, a coup. Um, and uh, in, in 1912, Madero is, is overthrown. Um, the head of the Mexican army, uh, Victoria Huerta, uh, takes, uh, takes over. Um, and uh, Ma uh, Madero is, in the aftermath of this, executed. The US makes a kind of de facto protest, but doesn't seem too, uh, too upset by, uh, by things. Um, it's entirely possible that all of the, unlike what happened in Nicaragua, where the US really was the dominant player, it's entirely possible that Madero would have risen and fallen without US assistance. But, the, but as with Nicaragua, Taft is playing this more active role. And unlike uh, Roosevelt, who had a very precisely defined strategic interest, Taft seems to be more kind of uh, garden style uh, imperialist factor. There are figures within the Republican Party who start to criticize Taft's approach. In the Senate, two different criticisms of Taft start to emerge. And these are, these are important players to keep in mind for, uh, for the next 10 years or so. Um, the, the man on the left is Robert La Follette. He's a, a Republican senator from Wisconsin, been governor, then elected to the uh, Senate. In the upper Midwest in this period, the Republican is basically, it's a one-party area. There are basically no Democratic Party. 
Lafollette is very liberal today. He would be, you know, sort of on in the kind of Elizabeth Warren uh, wing of the Democratic Party. So yes, he's a Republican, but, but ideologically he's very left. Um, he he becomes increasingly concerned uh, with Taft's foreign policy, which he sees as a reflexive promotion of the same American business and corporate interests that he Lafollette had been fighting domestically. And there are a group of senators who you know. Who sort of agree with Lafollette uh, called the Peace Progressives, um, who begin to develop an anti-imperialist critique of U.S. foreign policy during the Taft administration. We're going to be encountering these people again during Wilson and then during the 1920s when they emerge as major players in U.S. foreign policy. And then on the other side of the Republican Party, uh, this man, Henry Cabot Lodge, who is the Republican uh, senator from Massachusetts. He was a close friend of Theodore Roosevelt. And Lodge's critique of Taft is not that imperialism is bad. It's that Taft really isn't executing policy in a particularly uh, effective, uh, effective way. And he wants more of a cold, realistic, strategic-oriented uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, we will encounter both LaFollette and uh, Lodge as critics, albeit in different ways, of the will. Wilson uh, presidency. But as the Taft presidency comes to an end, there's this sense that, you know, things are, are working out relatively well internationally. In 1910, um, uh, there's this book by a European peace activist uh, uh, called Norman Angel uh, entitled The Great Illusion. And the, uh, it sells hundreds of thousands of copies. And the thesis of the book is that, that in the modern world, which is so economically interdependent, all industrialized countries are dependent on foreign trade um, with, um, um, uh, with, you know, with other countries. And there's a cultural interdependence, you know, you know Germans travel to France and, uh, you know, English citizens travel to Austria, Hungary, that in this kind of environment, uh, a major international war simply is not possible. Um, there are advantages to being a historian. We, we, we write about the past, so we can't really be proven wrong in the very short term. Um, Angel, as we all know, is going to be proven wrong very, very uh, uh, quickly. And our snippets for, for next week, um, that's, what we'll be, uh, that's what we'll be looking for, the nature of World War I. But that's all that we have for snippets for, uh, for this time.